It was not by chance that early populations began settling in the region. It was here that they found the indispensable element for all forms of life on Earth, water. It's thanks to the Atlas mountain range that water is present at the oasis of Tafilalt. Its slopes block humid air masses. When rain falls after flowing down the flanks of the mountains, it seeps through the soil and fills up the phreatic zone, and sometimes fills the riverbeds for a short while. This superficial surface water evaporates too quickly to be a regular source for crop irrigation. In pre-Saharan Morocco, the temperature is above 30 degrees for six months of the year. This phenomenon is common to all the desert regions of the planet, arid regions in which the phreatic zone represents the only constant water reserve, which mankind has had to learn to tap into over the course of the centuries. This is how the Katara system came to be developed. Kataras are underground canals built between the phreatic zone and the cultivated parts of the oasis. Some of them are 50 kilometers in length. The water travels by the force of gravity. For the last 15 years, one man has been mapping out and studying the Kataras of Tafilalt, Thierry Ruff. He's an agronomist and geographer from the Research Institute for Development. He fights for the conservation of this ancestral irrigation system. The life of the whole region depends upon it. Tafilalt is a legendary region in the history of Morocco. It's the doorway to Africa, the threshold of cultural exchange between the Mediterranean and sub-Saharan Africa. The oasis is a world of cooperation, of humanity and of exchange as well. The population is highly committed. They work together, perpetuating distribution methods, sharing the water resources which are essential in an oasian environment like this one. It's an extraordinary case study, and for the last 15 years, in collaboration with Moroccan universities, we have been working on this land and water management. Today, it has become clear that the oasis of Tafilalt is of huge importance for the future of the country and of the local population. Thierry Rouf is well aware that in Morocco, more than other places, Kataras are vital. When one of them becomes blocked, dozens of families feel the consequences. This is the case in the little village of Bouya, in the south of the region. One of the Kataras has been blocked for several days. The plots of land are not being irrigated and even show worrying signs of water shortage. The blocked canal will have to be repaired. It's a decision which concerns the whole village. It's a ritual. Works to be carried out are decided upon after Friday prayers, when the men meet for a jama, which means assembly in Arabic. All questions relating to water are discussed here. The upkeep of the Kataras is performed by the farmers of the oasis. The decision has been made to carry out work in the dry Katara. It's a risky business. The men meet to choose who is going to descend. We try to avoid accidents. Those who descend are frightened. Yes, they're frightened. It's risky. Some refuse to go. They're claustrophobic. It's totally dark down there, even with the torch. 
You walk, you see the spider webs. You can't see where you're going. There are places where you have some height, others where it's really low. You have to walk bent over. Yes, and you have to dig into the earth. Digging is difficult. It's always difficult to work there. Our ancestors dug with very restricted means to find water, hollow out the canals, and reach difficult parts. Thierry Ruf goes to the place where work on the blocked Katara is underway. He meets up with Lassan Almrani, a specialist in land development. For 15 years, he's been guiding Thierry Ruf in his field research. I've come to see the work, but I'd like you to explain to me what's happening. What is the main problem today with the Katara? The canal is blocked. It's filled with sediment and sand. The men of the village who are working today carry out surveillance and upkeep on the Katara all year round. Do they do this work each year? They do it twice a year. At the beginning of the agricultural campaign, during the months of September and October, and again between March and April. The young and the farmers are dedicated to the Kataras. As they say, it's our lifeblood. It's thanks to these Kataras that we are here. In order to gain access to the underground waterways, the path of each Katara is punctuated with wells every 10 meters. These are essential service hatches for those carrying out maintenance. Working in the Katara is stressful. In the afternoon, temperatures are up to around 50 degrees Celsius. The galleries were originally hollowed out using rudimentary tools. Today, maintenance is still carried out by hand. Candles are put in place to warn if there's a lack of oxygen. The laborers are obliged to work in shifts. There's a high risk of cave-ins. The men work at about 10 meters below ground level. Visibility is almost zero. It's necessary to dig meter by meter below water level to clear the passage. Thierry Ruf needs to know more about what caused the obstruction in this Katara. It's very interesting, because the headroom is much greater than I expected. It's almost three meters high. The height of the gallery shows that there were two successive digging levels. The original one, which is now the second, came down to here. This suggests that, faced with a water shortage between the 16th and 20th centuries, we can't date it precisely, people dug down further. Following this, more recently, they added about two kilometers to the length. Here you can see how humid the gallery is. This creates crust, as you see. After a while, this falls into the water, which is why cleansing needs to be done. There's water which comes from the phreatic zone and fills the bottom of the Katara. The floor of the Katara is almost watertight because it's covered in clay. This clay stops water filtering back through and it flows downhill for about three or four kilometers. It's this natural impermeability which allows water to arrive in large quantities. You have the same here as there is at the mouth of the Katara. I still find it amazing. We're in the desert, 
and there is water flowing in considerable quantity, which is needed by the population. You see this when you come down into the Katara, and it merits respect because it's a monument. Life depends on this arduous deep digging work over several kilometers. You feel humility towards the previous generations who built this. How are you? I'm okay. How long have you been coming down into the Katara? I've been working here for 30 years. You come down into the Katara each year for one day, 10 days? About two months. Two months? I know every meter of the Sagiyas and Kataras. And do you know what the maximum water level is in certain sections? The highest is here. Okay. It's hard work, huh? Yes, yes. If there were no Kataras here, men would travel. They would leave. They would leave. They would leave. All the men of the village of Bouya know the value of water. It can be calculated by the difficulties encountered in obtaining and conserving it. Each of them has seen their grandparents and parents stoically work in the underground canals. People also carry out this maintenance work because it affords them what is known in the palm groves of Morocco as water access rights. It's thanks to these that each farmer who participates in the work is authorized to irrigate his plot of land. After several days of work, water finally returns to the groves of the village. The irrigation cycle can recommence. Water coming from the Kataras supplies an irrigation network across the fields. These channels are called segias. Their path follows the slight undulations and slopes so that the water keeps moving and doesn't stagnate and evaporate. Irrigation is strictly controlled. Each farmer awaits their turn. Everything is discussed on Fridays during the Jama. It's the end of the summer and this year water has been particularly rare. Mohammed can at last irrigate his plants. He was born in the palm groves of Bouya. His family has participated in the upkeep of the Kataras for generations. We must never abandon our Kataras. This heritage is sacred for us. We must preserve it and keep it alive. It's a bequest which we have to protect as past generations did. Everybody knows when it's their turn for water and respects it. It's called your quarter and each farmer has their quarter. You only draw the water which you are allowed. Your turn comes every 12 days, sometimes in the morning, sometimes at midday. Water is divided up respecting the situation of each farmer. Some inherit, others buy their part. When it's his turn, Mohammed has access to what the Oasians call married water, water which belongs to a particular plot of land. Sometimes, however, Mohammed, like other farmers, needs supplementary quantities of water. This has to be bought from what is known as the bachelor water, water which doesn't belong to a particular plot. There isn't enough water to grow a lot, so we do a bit of everything. We grow wheat, alfalfa, vegetables such as carrots, turnips, peppers. But mostly we grow date palms. That's the key crop. The 
The diversity which Mohammed talks of demonstrates the complementarity of crops to be found in the palm groves. Here, each crop level helps and complements the others. Date palms provide shade. They allow the fruit trees further down to develop their fruits. And these trees leave room for cereal cultivation at their feet. These cereals provide the soil with nitrogen and allow farmers like Mohammed to feed their animals and multiply their resources. God says, we have made each living thing from water. Water is our only capital in this region. Without water, there would be nothing here. It's water which allows us to survive. It's our reason for staying here. There are no other resources, no industry.